is a Mr. Mallard to see you, Mr. Peacock. Mallard? Well, I wouldn't have thought so by the look of him. You're not with the BBC, are you? Yes. Apparently he is, yes. Certainly. Mr. Peacock will be with you in a moment, Mr. Mallard, if you'd like to sit down. Thank you. Um, is there a chair? Would you like a cup of tea? I'd love a cup of coffee. No, tea, I said. Richard III, good morning. I'm afraid Mrs. Arrowsmith is on maternity leave at the moment. Would you like to hold? 8.20 on a Thursday morning, and I've come to meet Nigel Peacock, headmaster of the Richard III Comprehensive School here in East Sussex. You're in Kent. Ashford is a town of some 36,000 people, which sits exactly halfway between Canterbury and um, a place called Newenden. But it's also about two-thirds of the way between Folkestone and Maidstone, if you're coming from Maidstone. Richard III is a mixed school with 1,200 students between the ages of 11 and 18 and 130 teaching and administrative staff. Obviously, they cover a much wider age range, but most of them are also mixed. Yes. Mr Peacock will see you now, Mr Mallard. Shall I send you in? Well, yes, please. Um, well, is it through here? Yes, all right. Nigel Peacock's working day begins with an 8.30 briefing with his two deputies, Graham Atkinson and Sheila Howarth. And their day begins with a briefing with, well, him. Um, yeah, well, apparently uh, she'd been in one of the pubs in town all lunchtime, and uh, when she came back to afternoon lessons, she was um, sick over the caretaker and passed out. Really? Sheila, perhaps you'd like to have her in and talk to her. Well, I'll certainly try, Nigel. Mm. No, I mean, apart from anything else, it, it, it sets a bad example to the oh, kids. Mm, yes, good point, Graham. Yes. Right, now, Sheila, have you managed to get any further with the Princep case? Well, I got another letter from the parents yesterday, mm -hmm. so I actioned a phone call to them, and they're coming in this afternoon at quarter to five. Good, and do they sound like reasonable people? I think the father's a QC. Really? What does he do for a living? I don't know, I didn't ask him. Um, what about the boy himself? Um, Graham? Um, well, um, mixed news. Uh, we've got him back in trousers for the moment, but he uh, ate his uh, integrated science project yesterday. Uh, I, I, I think we've got to be proactive on this one. Oh, right? yes, 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 so do I, so I. Proactive in what sense, exactly? Well, we don't need to decide that now, do we? No, no, of course not. No, 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 no. Right. Now, the uh, interviews for the new Head of Humanities, Graham, it's um, Jane Waterford, Simon Ferber this morning, and David Lawrence this afternoon, is that right? Uh, no, we, we, we're down to two now. Simon Ferber has, uh, has dropped out. Oh, I see. And uh, do we know why? His, uh, his doctor advised him to withdraw. I didn't know Simon was ill. No, he's not. It's just that his doctor's very bossy. Uh, huh? so, sorry, would you mind if I sat down? Uh, you need a chair. Yes. Clearly, it's going to be another busy and challenging day in the life of the school. The meeting with Giles Princep's parents isn't going to be easy. He's a difficult child and has already been suspended once after he tried to photocopy his genitals in a GCSE Spanish lesson. The interviews for the Head of Humanities post will need to be handled delicately as well. There's a danger that the unsuccessful candidate will feel that there's something wrong with them as a person, particularly since that's why they won't have got the job. Added to this, there's a staff meeting at the end of the day where there's to be discussion of a controversial new proposal to allow third formers to wear brown shoes. One of the first things I learned in this job is that if you treat children like children, they behave like children. Yes. It's rather obvious, isn't it? It's very obvious, yes. That's why I learned it first. Do you think you're good at what you do? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on what I'm doing, really. I reasonably good cook. Mm, I was really thinking of you as a headmaster. I am a headmaster. Yes. I think what I'm trying to raise with you is the whole issue of whether it's possible to judge or even to define success in the educational world. That's an even better question. Well, perhaps about the same. I don't know. No, no, it's better. Um, one thing I do know is that when I was appointed as head here 12 years ago, the school was threatened with closure because of falling rolls. Falling rolls? Mm. Rolls falling? Yeah. Cool. And since then, it's had doubled in size. Yes. It, it's still threatened with closure, though, isn't it? Well, I, I suppose it is, really. <phone rings> yes? Mr. Peacock, oh. there's a Mrs. Peacock on the phone for you. Oh. Uh, well, I'm, I'm busy at the moment. Can you take a message? Yes, certainly. Oh, I mean... Uh, from her, Barbara. 
A message from her? Yes, sir. May I just write that down? The senior management briefing over, it was off now to the main hall for what, when I was at school, would have been called the fourth form assembly. Though, as Nigel told me on the way, these days they aren't called the fourth form anymore. These days they aren't called the fourth form anymore. Really? Why is that? Uh, well, we call them year 11 now. Why year 11? Oh, it's, uh, it's horribly complicated, but it's uh, to do with the number of years they've been in education. Oh, I see. Yes, yes. So the mm. first year in primary school is year one and, and so on. Uh, yes. 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 <coughs> but uh, surely children who are in their fourth year here with you have been in education for ten years, not eleven. Sod it. Nigel sees assemblies as a vitally important mechanism for establishing the ethos of the school. Each year group meets on a different day, and the assemblies are based around the week's keyword. This week's keyword Before is we intercourse. Morning, I have a brief note from Mr. Ellis to say that this Friday's problem solving club will take place in the private study room on the fifth floor of the humanities block. But you're not allowed to use the stairs. Now, the word intercourse comes originally from the Latin inter, meaning between, and cursum, to run. But of course, it doesn't just mean the way in which we run between each other. <clears throat> I'm sure that most of you have already seen the connection between it and last week's key word, reproduction, which, if you remember, took us some way from our original starting point of furniture. I say most of you, because I know that there were... I left the assembly a few minutes early because I wanted to see if I could snatch a few words with David Lawrence and Jane Waterford, the interviewees for the head of humanities job. Jane, do you think that the fact that you're a woman is an advantage or a disadvantage when it comes to applying for more senior posts in the educational world? I'm Jane. Sorry. Sorry, David. Jane... Do you think the fact that you're a woman is an advantage or a disadvantage when it comes to applying for more senior posts in the educational world? Yes, I do. Right, right. Well, do you... Uh, do you... Sorry, I, I think I'm a bit, a bit tense. Would you mind if I smoked? You are smoking. Yeah. Right, right. This job's important to you, isn't it? It's very important for me. Mm. It's a key role within the school, and in personal terms, it's something I think I need very much. Hmm, well, that's interesting. Do you feel that you're at an age where if things don't happen for you now, they probably never will? Hmm. Oh. oh, dear. David, what would being successful today mean to you? It would mean I'd be head of humanities. Yes, and your current role is what? I'm second in the history department. Really? Second at what? No, I'm just second. Right, right. But I mean... So, wouldn't this new job, if you got it, actually take you away from the classroom? Bloody hell, I hope so. Also, I mean, this is interesting, isn't it? It's because presumably there was a time when you, you enjoyed being surrounded by children and playing a central role in determining how they thought and, and behaved. Yeah, well, I used to be like that a lot when I was a kid myself. I think I was probably a bit of a bully. Um, she hasn't come out yet. Do you think she's all right? With morning lessons underway, I found Nigel in the middle of his second meeting of the day with his deputies, Sheila Howarth and Graham Atkinson. Would I be in the way if I sat here? Uh, why do you want to be in the way? No, I, um, they were busy with the crucial task of drawing up a mission statement for the school, as required by law now, for submission to a forthcoming governor's meeting. Some reference to the kids, you know, some point. Yes, good point, Graham, good point. Um, I mean, what about um, to seek to ensure... Yes, hmm? that's very good, I like that. Right, um, hmm? uh, to seek to ensure that each pupil shall, uh, shall develop... Mm, that's very good, I like that. ...shall develop, um... Mm. Well, well, should we just leave it at that? Shall develop? Oh, I mean, it's punching. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, it's a bit... Uh, a, bit, a, bit, a, bit a bit general. No, no, I mean, well, I don't know. It's a bit risky, isn't it? I mean, you know, a lot of them don't develop. Mm -hmm. Yes. Before I knew it, it was time for morning break, although, of course, I didn't know that. Yes. So, whilst the officers continued the strategic planning in Nigel Peacock's office, I took the opportunity to go to the staff room where I was to meet the foot soldiers, in the shape of English teacher Neil Thompson. They had their own key made and, um, you know, been at it hammering tongues every lunchtime since half time. Yes, and no one could figure out why he used to sleep straight through double chemistry in the afternoon. I, I, mean, I mean, it doesn't bother me one way or the other, but it just sets a bad example to the kids. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought Excuse of that. Excuse me, I'm looking for Neil Thompson. Why? Pardon? Why are you looking for him? Well, I think he's expecting me. Oh, and is that why you've come? Yeah. Oh, it's really nice. Mm -hmm. well, uh, that's him over there hitting the uh, coffee machine. Right. Oh. 
nothing nice when things work out like that. <laughs> Neil Thompson. Hello, yes. Roy Mallard. Who? People like us. What do you mean by that? Uh, Nigel Peacock said you'd be expecting me. Oh, oh, that's right, but I'm afraid I haven't had time. But who are you? Uh, Roy Mallard, BBC Radio 4. Right, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I get you a cup of coffee? Um, I think I'd prefer tea. No, I said coffee, it's no trouble. I'm, I'm getting one for myself. It's just a knack, really. Oh. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> I think you can buy some stuff to get that out. It's OK, they're not my best ones. So I was to spend part of the time between now and lunchtime out there on the front line with Neil's Year 10 English class. Year 9, 11. Hey, you. Your trousers are wet. It's coffee. Here, Alison, yes, Giles, Giles Princep. Anyone know where Giles is? Mr. Davis threw him out of math this morning, sir. Really? What for? Drug dealing. Right. You see that bloke's trousers? Neil is an NQT, which stands for not quite. It means that it's his first year of teaching. After graduating from the University of the West of Suffolk with a joint degree in English Studies and Maritime Sociology, Neil was determined to aim for a career which was both intellectually stimulating and of intrinsic worth in human terms. But in the end, he chose teaching. And this morning, for the next hour and ten minutes at least, he's responsible for the development of 31 young minds, each individual potentially capable of that awakened interest which may be the flint that creates the spark, that ignites the kindling of the tinderbox of flaming future on fiery things for achievements and hamlet is depressed and upset isn't he uh, because his father has died although he doesn't yet know how and his uh, his mother has remarried his uncle claudius how, how has hamlet's father died can you remember that hmm? claudius killed him didn't he that's right yes, yes I, i'd have thought you'd have known that yes well i am aware Sir, of the can i go to the low place no when I was a 15-year-old, I naturally assumed that my English teacher simply used to turn up every day and say whatever came into his head first. In fact, I know he did, because it was always the same thing that came into his head first, and, and then one day he said it to the French mistress and, and was fired. But now, as Neil made his way from desk to desk, reassuring, cajoling, challenging, as appropriate, I was struck by how very different the teaching process is when seen from an adult perspective. Mr Thompson? Anastasia. Joe. Joe, yes, sir. When you say a character study of Polonius in Acts 4 and 5... Yes, yes. Well, he dies in Act 3. Uh, keep it short, then. Try, try to be succinct. But OK, then. Good. Uh, yes, Ben? I didn't say anything, sir. Oh, I thought you did. No, sir. And it's Michael. Michael, yes. As Neil threw himself into an explanation of the diagram of a sea of troubles which he'd drawn on an overhead transparency, it was time for me to leave and make my way back to Nigel Peacock's office. On my way there, I met Jane Waterford on the way out of her interview for the Head of Humanities Post. So, how did it go? I've always found that interviews are rarely as bad as you think they're going to be. <coughs> interviews can be a stressful occasion at the best of times, and it seemed only natural that Jane needed to be on her own for a while in the women's toilets. It had been arranged that I should have a light working lunch in the headmaster's office at one o'clock. I was assured by Barbara, his secretary, that it wouldn't be long before the headmaster returned from his own heavy lunch in the canteen. When he did, we were able to talk for a while over coffee about some of the challenges and pressures which are part and parcel of his job. What have you done to your face? It's nothing. So, do you think that the relatively recent unleashing of market forces mm. on education has helped you to do your job more effectively or made it more difficult? Mm. It's not... Quite as good a question as I thought it was going to be. Oh. Still. I've never personally seen market forces as something to worry about. I mean, if... Oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Barbara? Excuse me, Mr. Peacock. Mm -hmm. I have a call for you from a Mr. Burnham. I don't think I know anyone called Burnham. Is it serious? I don't think so. Why should you? Uh, is what he's phoning about serious? He's a resident in Hatterley Road and someone set fire to his rabbits this morning. My God. And he thinks that one of our kids did it? It was a boy of about 15, and he was in school uniform, except that he didn't have any trousers on. Princess, Barbara, I need a bit of time on this one. Can you say I'm in a meeting at the moment, but I'll get back to him before two? Before two what? 
not, Mr. Peacock. Long, Barbara, before too long. I see, yes, mm. certainly. Where were we? Market forces. Oh, yes, yes. Yep. Well, the way I see it is that if I ran a setup which sold apples, for instance, right. or, or made, well, uh, apples, right. yes, then it, it would be different, but I don't. Ah, but an apple grower will only survive if he produces apples which are better in quality or cheaper in price mm. than the apple grower down the road. Mm. And he'll need an understanding wife as well, won't he? You, well, yes, but the point is... Yeah, because it's hard work growing apples all day. Yes, it is, yes, but... Yeah, uh, and he'll be very tired in the evenings and weekends. Yes, he will, yes, but the point is that you're now governed by exactly the same forces as that apple grower, aren't you? I mean, uh, if your students are of inferior quality or cost more to educate than those at other schools in the area, then parents will send their children to those other schools and the government will reduce your funding. Yes, but I mean... Apples can be nice and red or crunchy, but how can you possibly say whether one child is superior to another? Well, exam results, for instance. Headmaster. Uh, um, sh I, shall I open a window? After lunch, I made my way to the gym, where I was to meet PE teacher Keith Evans, whose gymnastics lesson with a year with a group of 11-year-olds was already underway. OK, now this time let's really gather pace as we approach the springboard so that we arrive at the horse with plenty of momentum, OK? That's what good vaulting's all about, momentum. OK, right, well, you're first again, Linda. Yeah, and don't worry, I'm here to catch you if anything goes wrong. All right, then, here we go. Now, that's good, Linda. Don't worry, really go for it. That's good. Keith, hello. Oh, hello. At one time, Keith had visions of himself as a professional footballer, but a serious car accident in his early 20s changed all that. For several months, he had visions of himself as a variety of small animals, but he eventually recovered and went into teaching. Uh, a lot of fun has been out of the job, yeah. You know, everything's got to be quantified now, measured written down, records of achievement, schemes of work, operational plans. So do you feel... Jim Hill! Why are you wearing sunglasses? I can't get them off, sir. Oh, really? Yeah, what do you think I am, stupid? Just to teach PE? No, I really can't, sir. Giles Princip staple gunned them on a break time. Oh. Right, well... Do some star jumps, then. Sorry. Yes, so, so do you feel that you're moving further and further away from what initially attracted you to teaching as a fit young PE man? Oh, without a doubt, yes. Mm. What was it that attracted you to teaching? Fit young PE women. Right, yes. Yeah, uh, slightly older, you know, yes. they were very fit. <laughs> yes, so, so I mean, what kind of contribution do you expect? Bloody hell, how did you get him to do that? I can't stop him. He's got an inner ear problem. Doesn't assemble sometimes. Really? So, anyway, um, exactly what kind of contribution do you expect, or indeed have you a right to expect, from the headmaster? I, I don't think this is really his scene. You know, he's too fat, he's too old. No, I'm, I'm... Apparently, he's not a bad cook, though. Yes, I've heard that. By mid-afternoon, the hum of the busy school day had changed pitch subtly. For many, it was a day which would merge indistinguishably into the texture of school day memories. But there were at least two people for whom, in retrospect, it would always be significant, perhaps a turning point. On my way out of the gym, I ran into one of them, David Lawrence, just coming out of his interview for the head of humanities job. So, how do you think it went? Oh, it was fine. I enjoyed it. I think it's in the bag. Right, good. Well, that's a very confident approach, isn't it? So, I mean, has there been, has there been any point in your preparation for the interview when you thought about how you'd react if things didn't actually go your way? Piss off. Right. Fair enough, yes. Good point. I was fortunate to get back to Nigel's office just in the nick of time to hear the concluding comments in the final selection process. Hi. <sighs> right, well, that's that then. Oh, good, right. good. Oh. I couldn't help wishing that I'd got back just a few minutes sooner, so after the meeting had broken up, I asked Nigel what I'd missed. Well, it wasn't at all a straightforward decision, I'm afraid. We were evenly split. But there are three of you. Mm. Yes, but we, we do it on a show of hands. There were six hands. Right. So, so, which way did it go in the end? Well, eventually we came up with the idea that we should give it to the candidate whose strategic vision of how the job might develop was the more innovative. Yes, I see. Mm. Unfortunately, we were evenly split on whether that was a good idea or not, too. So it looks like we're going to have to re-advertise. Was the gender issue a factor in your decision? Oh, well, it was, yes, yes. But there was one of each, so it didn't really solve the problem. No, right.
By quarter to five, with most of the pupils having gone home long ago, the teaching staff were beginning to drift away in ones and twos, and one rather intriguing three. But Nigel Peacock's day was still far from over. What was potentially the most delicate human challenge was still to come. The meeting with Giles Princeps' parents. Hello, uh, nice to meet you. I'm, oh, I'm glad you've come. No, 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 I'm Roy Mallard. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, sorry, yes, sorry. Yes, hello, yes, nice to meet you. Hello, I'm, I'm glad you could come. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, now, do sit down, please. Uh, <laughs> not you. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> now, uh, I had hoped that um, Charles's personal tutor, Mr. Griffiths, would be joining us, but I've just been told that he's, in fact, Unable to leave the rehearsal, the orchestra rehearsal. Oh, well, I have to say I'm I'm not particularly impressed with that, particularly since we've uh, both taken time off work to be here. Yes, yes. yes. Well, I, I agree with you. It's very unfortunate, but I'm afraid he's been super glued to the harp, which Darling, brings us. I don't actually work. I'm sorry, darling. I rather thought you did. No. Which not so. Actually. Sorry. Uh, brings us mm. to the question of Charles's overall approach to life in school in recent months. Yes. Um, now, this is his, um, his file in front of me. As you can see, it's very thick and it's also a sort of buff colour, although it's the thickness that I want to concentrate on. Yes, look, um, before you say anything, Mr Peacock, I, I think it's only fair to tell you that uh, we sat down and uh, we had a long talk with him last night, mm. and uh, <clears throat> eventually we got it out of him that he doesn't get on at all well with the art master. Mm. Well, you might be interested to know that he, he doesn't take any art anymore. He doesn't? Mm. And yet he still goes around calling himself the art master. <laughs> no wonder Giles didn't get on with it. Sorry, Giles, sorry, Giles hasn't been to an art lesson for over three years. I told you, Victor. I can always tell when he's lying. I mean, that's illogical. I mean, for all you know, he might be lying all the time. He is lying all the time. That's why I can always <coughs> tell. But one of the things that this file tells me is that of the ten staff who teach Giles, seven of them think that his presence is having a seriously damaging effect on other pupils in the group. I see. What about the other three? Well, they think so too. I'm sorry. I was trying to break it to you gently. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can't really say it's a surprise to us, uh, Mr. Peacock. We, we did wonder whether it was the right thing to do, to take him out of the uh, private system at the age of 11. He was very happy at Cullet Court. Oh, darling, you know very well he was continually running away. Yes, but he used to so enjoy running away. Now, uh, of course, I'm, I'm well aware that we have to think about what's best for Giles. Hmm. Yes, but, but, but then again, of course, he is only one of 1,200 children. Mm. Good grief, I didn't know that. I meant here in your school. Oh, I see, I see, yes, yes, oh, absolutely. Slowly, skillfully, gently... Nigel was steering the princeps through the emotional minefield which many parents before them have had to negotiate. In the end, it was decided to tackle the problem in stages. Giles should initially be kept under supervision at lunch times and break times. He should then see an educational psychologist and then be expelled. The job of a head carries with it an undeniably heavy weight of responsibility, but very little of the glamour, status or financial reward that can often go with senior positions in other walks of life, such as fashion designing, film stunt work or arms dealing. What about shall maximise? Mm -hmm. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, excellent, yep, yeah, this feels good. Shall maximise their... Uh, their options... No, I'm not sure about that. No. no. Group get a bit sticky with kids who haven't got any options. Yes. Good point, Graham. That's right, Graham. Their potential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, same problem there, really. Yeah. Um, optimal. Yes. Hmm? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, shall mm. maximise their optimal... what? Potentiality? Yes. Yes. Is anyone writing this down? Yes, I am. Oh, good. Of course, I'd like to be head eventually. Yes, I'd be lying if I said I didn't. And presumably the head of humanity's job would have been a step in that direction. Or would you be lying if you'd said that as well? No, I'd be telling the truth then. So, what will you do now? Well, I've always believed in setting myself achievable goals. I've set myself a target of becoming deputy within a period of two years. And you're what, um, 45 now? 31. Thirty. Right, yes. But, but I mean, aren't you putting yourself under unnecessary pressure? No, I don't think so. I'm not going to start the two-year period until I'm 38. Oh. 
No, I, I mean, you know, he's, he's got a very difficult job to do, I and mean, good luck to him, you know. I mean, I could never do it. I know I'd have a nervous breakdown. Not because the pressures involved are so great? No, because I've had two already. Oh. OK, and breathe out. <laughs> <laughs> With the educational world in flux, headmasters are perhaps poised uneasily between a teaching force which is instinctively sceptical about the values of the business environment and, and other, other forces which aren't, don't. Day in, day out, it's the job of people like Nigel Peacock to encourage each side to trust the other side. I've always thought, well, a very promising question, by the way, I've always thought of a school like this as... As an orchestra. Orchestra. Mm. Mm. I'm the conductor, my staff are the musicians, each with their own very different contributions to make to the music which we produce. Yes, I see, yes. And, and your job <coughs> your job is to select a, an appropriate score and mm. decide how that score can best be interpreted uh, yes. and make sure that everyone is aware of the, the overall effect that you're striving for. Mm. Mm. My job is to stand at the front and wait at that, um, that thing in the air. Yeah, what's it called? A baton. Is it really? Baton. Baton. Yes. Yes. And what about the children? Pardon? Well, I mean, where do they come in your analogy? Of course, probably thinking of school as an orchestra is that I don't know the first thing about music. It's unlucky, really. Yes, it is. You may like to know that after this programme was made, Giles Princep was sent by court order to a special school in Sussex, which has since closed. After a month of living rough, he was offered room in a hospice run by an order of silent nuns in Hastings. He's now a father. Roy Mallard would like to give a special thank you to Chris Langham and also to Nicholas Le Provo, Alice Arnold, Kim Wall, Linda Regan, Toby Longworth, Kay Stonham, Vincent Franklin and Deanfield School in Reading. The programme was written by John Morton and produced by Paul Schlesinger.